input impedance, the radiation pattern of the dipole antenna varies with frequency, or more informatively, it varies with electrical length. So again, I'll give you the equations and then we'll look at some illustrative plots. So here is the equation for the directivity of a dipole antenna. Note that the directivity depends on theta, the angle from the z-axis, but not on phi. That's because the directivity of a dipole is symmetric about the z-axis, so the phi value doesn't matter. In this equation, f of theta is given by this equation, and q is given here. Note that, like input impedance, the equations for directivity depend on the electrical length, kL, not on the physical length, L. Again, you can write these equations into a program to calculate the directivity for any arbitrary electrical length and theta value, and I do recommend that you go ahead and do that to help develop a feel for what these equations describe. We'll also take a look at some plots of directivity at various electrical lengths. Now, since the radiation pattern is symmetric with respect to phi, we can fully describe the radiation pattern by plotting it on any constant phi plane. So, for instance, this is a plot of the radiation pattern of the half-wave dipole on the plane phi equals zero. Since you know that this will look exactly the same no matter what value of phi you choose, this tells you the entire radiation pattern. Now, for ease of visualization, I like to also plot the other half of the plane we're looking at. So, on the other side of phi equals zero, we have phi equals 180. So, I'll go ahead and show the radiation pattern on that side, too. This is purely a matter of preference. It's exactly symmetric, so there's no information being added here. But this is my preferred format, and I'll be using it for all of my radiation plots. Here is the directivity of the dipole antenna plotted as the frequency increases from one-fifth of the design frequency up to ten times the design frequency. As the length of the antenna goes from one-tenth to five wavelengths. You can see that the direction of maximum directivity varies with frequency, as does the value of the maximum directivity and the number of lobes. Notice particularly at the low end of this frequency range, as the antenna goes from 0.1 wavelengths up to 1 wavelength, the antenna has only one lobe, broadside and symmetric about the z-axis. At frequencies above this range, there are more lobes than one, and the radiated power is no longer focused broadside. So here's a plot of the maximum directivity observed in any direction over a range of frequencies up to L equals 3 wavelengths. The maximum directivity observed in this range is approximately 3.3 and occurs at L equal one and a quarter wavelengths. Now, you might be tempted to think that this means the antenna is working optimally at this frequency, but I want to make clear that this is not necessarily true, even if your intent is to radiate a focused broadside signal. Let me point out two other factors that must be taken into consideration. Firstly, Remember that the input impedance is also varying over this range. If you choose any frequency that is not resonant, you're going to need to account for a large amount of reactive input impedance. And if you choose a frequency at which the real part of the impedance is very large, you may have to develop a complicated matching mechanism in order to be able to feed the antenna with a realizable transmission line. So input impedance is a critical consideration when evaluating various antenna designs. Even assuming that you're able to achieve a perfect impedance match, you must remember that directivity is a measure of how well an antenna focuses its radiated power in a particular direction, to the exclusion of other directions. It does not give you a complete picture of how well an antenna converts input power into radiation in a particular direction, because it ignores antenna losses. In other words, an antenna that hardly radiates at all a very inefficient radiator may have very high directivity as long as it's very selective about the direction in which it sends the little power it does radiate. By contrast, an antenna with lower directivity, though it sends more power in the wrong directions too, may also result in a higher signal strength in the desired direction as the result of its better efficiency. 
Antenna gain, on the other hand, is the portion of actual input power that is successfully converted into radiation in a particular direction. It has the same pattern as directivity, but it's scaled by the antenna efficiency. It's smaller for inefficient radiators and larger for efficient radiators. And antenna efficiency also varies with frequency. I've put a link in the description of this video that goes to a module where you can learn how to simulate the dipole antenna in HFSS, which will enable you to explore this topic in further detail on your own.